Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today, we launch into a new sermon series about Joseph's journey called From Pit to Palace. The scripture we will study is in Genesis chapter 37. The Life Notes are ready for download from calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab a Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37 is our text today. And uh, if you are in any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible uh, with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 36. 36. I know usually it's like 1,000 something. No, it's 36. Genesis is the very first, you know, uh, book in the Bible. And so we're going to be on page 36. I'm going to move this so I don't stare at it the whole time when I look to the left. Uh, Yeah, does that look better? It does for me. Uh, But uh, if, uh, and and by the way, if you're in in one of our campuses and you don't own a Bible and you want one, please take one. It's our gift to you. Okay. Uh, But if you turn to page 36, you can follow along with us. Uh, And by the way, if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please just ask for one. Either message the service host or email us at calvaryaz.com. And we'll be glad to get you a Bible. Because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, I'm excited uh, because uh, on Sunday at noon at our McCulloch campus, we are hosting the Faith and Grace Luncheon. Uh, That is... uh, uh, on tomorrow for those who are, who are joining me live right now. But uh, it is tomorrow, and, and I would love for it to say that everybody could join me tomorrow, I'll buy you lunch, but I can't because we've only got like 10 spots left. And so uh, if you're here and you're like, oh, I meant to sign up and I didn't sign up and I want to, then see me after the service and uh, we'll fill up the spots until they're full and then, uh, and then sorry. But if you really want to go and you really want to support Faith and Grace, it is the, the only domestic violence shelter in Lake Havasu City and we are big supporters of them. And if so, if you'd like to come and support them as well and learn more about uh, that incredible uh, ministry to women and children that are caught in domestic violence, then please see me after the service. I'll be out in the foyer right there. And the other thing I want to mention before we dive into uh, a new series is uh, you guys know that the, you know, southeastern part of the United States has been hammered with hurricanes these last couple of weeks. And people have asked, hey, are we going to take up an offering? Are we going to do something to help them? And I want you to know that we already are. We just didn't, you know, stand up and tell you because, uh, you know, technically we are a Southern Baptist church and as such we're a part of 45,000 other churches and Uh, a lot of our mission dollars go to fund an organization that has, as part of its ministry, disaster relief. In fact, Southern Baptist Disaster Relief is the third largest disaster relief organization in the world. And so you're a part of that. And on the ground right now uh, are, are thousands of men and women volunteering, cooking meals, mudding out homes, uh, helping to, to restore and, and fix and pray and share the gospel while they're doing that. And uh, we actually have uh, members of disaster relief teams in our church, but Arizona disaster relief teams have not been called to go back east yet. So, uh, so we're supporting that through uh, activity. We're supporting that through money. Uh, it's part of our regular mission dollars. We're doing that all the time. You're doing that all the time. But if you would like to earmark money for that, you can certainly do that. You can just simply put disaster relief uh, on a check or on your online donation, and we will pass that on to the people who are doing the boots on the ground, providing food, providing care, providing help, providing uh, restoration uh, services that, uh, that are taking place right now. And by the way, most of the, the biggest disaster relief organizations are in the states that were hit. And so their people are on the ground set up. Uh, they've got uh, an amazing network of help. So all of them were, were like ready day one and uh, are doing that. So I just wanted you guys to know, people have asked me, are we gonna do something? And I'm like, we are. <laughs> we already are, but uh, we need to keep praying for them. And, uh, and our team that is part of the Arizona team is on standby, but uh, they don't expect to be called at this point. They just wait for something bad to happen out west. So uh, yeah, it's what they're there for, right? It's what we're there. Oh, hey, speaking of bad things happening. Uh, hey, I have come to realize after 62 years of life and 43 years of ministry 
that all families are crazy. <laughs> yeah, my family's crazy, your family's crazy, the families of the people sitting around you, they're nuts, okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you, everybody, everybody's families in town are crazy. And, you know, and, I, and by the way, I hope that statement does not offend you uh, it's not meant to offend you, and uh, by the way, if it does offend you, did you really think your family is the one normal one? <laughs> I mean, look, some families are crazy fun. Some families are crazy strange. Some are crazy addicted, some are crazy greedy, some are crazy athletic. You've been around those families? It's like, wow, where did you guys come from? Because some are, are, are crazy painful and abusive. So here's what I want you to do. Just take uh, a few seconds, and I want you to share with one of your neighbors. Uh, you've got 10 seconds. they got 10 seconds. So if you add that up, that's 20 seconds, okay? I want you to tell them one way that your family was strange, weird, crazy, funny, different, okay? One way that your family was crazy. Here you go. Ready, set, go. 20 seconds. We should have a countdown clock. Oh, I think this has got a life bigger than 20 seconds. I think we just started some group therapy in the church right now. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you to uh, continue those delightful conversations in your life groups this week or in your step studies this group, group this week or maybe with your counselor this week. Uh, so, because you, uh, you might need to. Hey, uh, my family was crazy in uh, three major ways. They were crazy workaholics, they were crazy about moving, and they were crazy religious. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I always knew we were going to have chores to do. That was never a question I had to ask. In fact, I tried not to ask it because if I ask it, that meant that they were going to give me a new list, and I didn't want the new list. Uh, but we were always working. I mean, in fact, my parents were such crazy workaholics that they both had full-time jobs. My mom usually had another part-time job, and they thought, hey, for fun, let's build houses on the side. So uh, that, they were crazy moving. We were moving all the time. And I, and I say that, and I've shared that. I lived in 15 houses in eight cities in four states in 18 years. So yeah, and there was no reason to it. Uh, just they were nuts, okay? Uh, and then crazy religious. We were going to church. We never had to ask, are we going to church this weekend? We went to church every single weekend, every single Sunday. Uh, we're going to get up. We're going to go to church. We're going to go to church Sunday night. We didn't have to ask, are we going back? We knew it. We're going to miss Disney again. And uh, so, uh, by the way, I'm still rebelling against two of those three. Uh, but uh, today we're kicking off a new series. And it's from pit to palace. It's Joseph's journey. And Joseph's family was crazy dysfunctional. Now, I just want to take a moment and clarify which Joseph we're talking about because there are three significant Josephs in the Bible. First of all, there is Old Testament Joseph. His story is found in Genesis 37 through 50. So you probably have an idea we're talking about him. And then there's kind of like Christmas Joseph. You guys know Christmas Joseph, right? It, it, you know, Mary is the mother of Jesus and it was Mary Ann. Oh, good, you guys got the answer right. That's good. <laughs> Uh, and so he was Jesus' stepdad, and he was, he's talked about Matthew and Luke, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke tell his story. Uh, not a lot, but about four chapters total. And then you've got Easter Joseph. Now, Easter Joseph, sometimes people forget about, or they think he's, you know, connected to the others, but he's not. And this is Joseph of Arimathea, and he's mentioned in all four Gospels. He's the guy, the rich guy, who donated his tomb for Jesus' body to be placed in after the crucifixion. So, I mean, significant. All three, hugely significant in the story. But we're talking about Old Testament Joseph for the next several weeks. And, by the way, he lived about 1,600 years before Jesus. Uh, and, uh, and this is Jesus' ancestor, and his family was crazy. Uh, so let me just tell you a little bit about the story of Joseph's family. Genesis 37, we're going to look at that and walk through this passage in just a moment. But we're talking about lineage, 
This is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's family. In fact, Jacob is uh, Joseph's dad. And, uh, and then God changed Joseph's name to Israel, so sometimes in, in there you'll hear him referred to as Israel. Same guy, Jacob is uh, the dad. And so his dad was Isaac and his dad was Abraham. So these are the founding fathers of Israel. In fact, the nation of Israel is named after Jacob. God changed his name to Israel. They became the Israelites. And he had 12 sons and all that kind of stuff. So these are Jesus' ancestors. And there's three clear ways the family was crazy. First of all, they were a blended family. How many of you came, are a part of a blended family? One way or another. A lot of hands go up, so I don't have to explain this to you. I'll try it with the others. Uh, blended family. So look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 37. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. And then this is the story. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, of them to their father. So, all right, blended family. Uh, you already hear him mentioned, you know, the brothers of these wives and that kind of stuff. So Jacob had four wives. I know, it's not ideal. It's not the way that uh, we, we live these days. But at the time, he had four wives. He actually had two wives and two what you would call concubines, and which uh, were wives that his uh, wives gave to him and said, uh, have babies with these, with these ladies. And, and because here's the situation, Jacob was, had four wives, and, they were, and the wives were engaged in a baby-making competition. Okay, that's the story. Okay, how many sons can we have? And he ended up having 12 sons, so Joseph had 11 brothers, 12, 12 sons of Jacob by four different moms, and Jacob did not even play in the NBA. So for those of you that get that, yeah. For those of you that don't, ask someone after the service. Um, so Joseph had 10 half-brothers, all of them older, and, and so this is a crazy family situation just from the start. And then we see... Second way they're crazy is family favoritism. So pick up in verse 3. Now Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Family favorites. All right, let's just go ahead and do a poll. How many of you were the favorite child? Raise your hand. I can't raise mine. So, uh, all right. Some of you are like, I was the favorite. Uh, if, if your siblings sitting together and you both raise your hands, then we're going to have to talk. But uh, see, Jacob played favorites. And in doing that, he created this unhealthy, dysfunctional attitude among his kids. I mean, Joseph was the first child, the first son from Jacob's favorite wife. If you have a favorite wife, you're in trouble. I have a favorite wife, but I only have one. Uh, but, uh, you know, the fact that he had a favorite wife was trouble. The fact that he had a favorite son, uh, you know, was a tr it was trouble for the family. That's unhealthy situation. I mean, he gave, you know, Joseph gifts. He gave him the coat of many colors. And, and, the, bro and the way he treated him was different because the brothers saw the way that their dad loved Joseph more. And they hated him. And so that results in the third dysfunction is sibling rivalry. <laughs> how many of you have brothers or sisters? Siblings, how many of you have siblings? Okay, yeah, how many of you had sibling rivalry? Yeah, hopefully it's not still as bad, but it probably is. Okay, so uh, look, first of all, and, 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 and Joseph uh, made some choices that didn't help this, okay? So let's just say this. First thing he did was... Uh, you know, he, he kind of like told his brothers about these dreams that he had. And if you read verse five following, it says, now Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words, but he didn't stop there. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, behold, I have dreamed another dream. I'm sure you want to hear it. 
Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. So, look, either Joseph, I'm just going to say this. He was not very bright at this moment because I have older brothers. And if I had shared a dream like that, I would have been pinned to the ground with them tormenting me. Right? I mean, it just, it was, it was what would happen, okay? I'd have somebody drooling in my face, tickling me till I peed, uh, just <laughs> making life miserable. So, uh, so Joseph is either stupid, which we know he's not because the story lets us know he's brilliant, or he's clueless, or he's arrogant. So it's got to be clueless or arrogant. Uh, because like I said, if I'd done that to my brothers, it wouldn't have been pretty. But instead of torturing Joseph, his brothers decided to kill him. Yeah, isn't that nice? Pick up at verse 18. Now see, in, in verses 12 through 17, the brothers are off tending the sheep, and dad sends Joseph to go check on them. Now remember, he's already brought a bad report. He's already been ratting his brothers out, which, look, I had older brothers, I knew. I, I was not going to turn state's evidence on them. I was not going to rat them out. I was not going to tattletale because then it would be worse than it was in the beginning, right? So, but Joseph didn't get that. So he was, dad sent him to him. He's like, all right, I'll go check these guys out, make sure they're doing a job. Uh, and it says, the brothers saw him from afar, verse 18, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him in one of the pits. And then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands saying, let us not take his life. Reuben was the oldest, but he had made some really bad choices and had kind of lost his position. So he's trying to like suck up to dad is what he's doing. So let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him because Reuben was planning to re rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. So basically he was in a well, and, uh, but it was a dry well, and he's trapped there. Uh, look, I don't know how about you guys, but let me just ask, how many of you tormented your siblings at some point? Okay, a lot of you did. Um, I, look, I, had a, I had a mean oldest brother, and I really thought there was a few times where he was going to kill me, but I knew he wasn't really plotting to kill me. All right, I was, I was just an annoyance to him. Uh, but, you know, his brothers were actually planning to murder him. That's messed up. Okay? That, that's really a dysfunctional family. But ultimately, they didn't kill him because the story goes on. Instead, they just sold Joseph into slavery. Verse 25, then they sat down to eat and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for is our brother our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then the Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Um, so they really actually sold him as a slave. I know you... you some of you older brothers, older sisters, you teased, you know, your, your younger siblings about you were adopted or we're going to sell you to the neighbors or whatever. But they actually sold their brother to be a slave. Now, can we agree this is one majorly dysfunctional family? Okay. Now, this is where we pause the story of Joseph. It is from pit to palace, but we got another week or two to get there. So, uh, so I hope you will tune in for the, the further adventures of Joseph. But uh, that's Joseph's journey. I want to talk about the story of our families. The story of our families. You see, the biblical stories give us examples of how God works in the midst of dysfunction. And there are lessons that we can learn. There are things that we can discover about ourselves, about our families, about the way that God would have us to live, and about our realities. And so I just want to make three observations that I see in the story of Joseph, part one. 
And the first one is simply this. God uses dysfunctional people raised in dysfunctional families. God uses dysfunctional people raised in dysfunctional families. I mean, Joseph's family was crazy in multiple ways, and get, yet God used them to, first of all, establish Israel as a nation, and then to use Israel to bring Jesus into this world to be the Savior of all mankind. Okay, so, so that's a huge way that he used this crazy, messed up family. And by the way, every family is crazy, messed up. Just your story is not written in the Bible. <laughs> Except it kind of is, right? Because we can all relate to the story in some different ways. So the reason I'm telling you that is because I don't want you to think that because your family was crazy, whether that was crazy addiction, crazy abuse, crazy materialistic, or even part of a cult, that God can't use you for his kingdom or for his glory. Okay, that, that's reality. In fact, if you read the Bible, you discover that other than Jesus, everyone that God uses is just plain old messed up. I mean, they got problems, they got issues. So let me just be really clear. Your past, your weaknesses, your dysfunctions do not disqualify you from God's love. They do not disqualify you from serving God. They do not disqualify you from being used by God to make a difference for his kingdom. Okay? God loves to redeem broken people and broken families. That's what he does. That's one of the truths out of the story of Joseph. So if you have been believing the lie of Satan that because of your abuse or your addiction or your promiscuity or your divorce or your criminal record or your lies or your unethical business practices in the past, you weren't allowed ever to serve Jesus, I want to challenge that understanding. I want you to see the story of Joseph and understand that just because you've made mistakes, just because your past is a mess, just because you failed in some ways, or right now you're currently failing and you think that God can't forgive you, he can and he does. You see, that's the promise of God, that he can redeem anyone. You see, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe that he was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then God is redeeming your life and all of your sins in the past are forgiven. Guess what? All your sins in the future are forgiven as well by the blood of Jesus. Cover, cleanses us of all our sins. And so you are a new creation and we serve a God who delights in redeeming people's lives. So look at your neighbor, because this is hard for us to hear, and I just want you to tell your neighbor, God can even redeem you. Yeah, and I want you to believe him, because God can even redeem you. You guys really like this talking stuff. It's my job. All right, so, so God uses dysfunctional people raised in dysfunctional families. Second thing that I see in this story is that all parents bless and curse their children. All parents bless and curse their children. I mean, Jacob blessed Joseph with love, attention, gifts, and ultimately, he taught him a faith in God. Okay? Those are great blessings. Gave him a foundation of faith. Jacob cursed Joseph by playing favorites, by, by flaunting his favoritism in front of the other brothers, the other sons, and by having a favorite wife and a favorite son. So let me just go ahead and kill the myth right now. There are no perfect parents. Do not believe Instagram or TikTok, okay? I don't know. If you don't know what those are, then you're, uh, don't, just don't believe what other people say. There's just no perfect parents, okay? And oh, I hate to break this to you, but your kids aren't perfect either. All right, now look, if your kids are grown, you already know that right? But uh, if you have kids at home, then sorry, but uh, I just want you to hear what my uh, oldest daughter, Amber, calls uh, her children. She goes, my children are perfect little sinners, <laughs> which is true. All kids are. They're wonderful. They're beautiful, but they're rebels, you know? That's why a two-year-old will run away from you when you say, come here, <laughs> right? They, I mean, because they're not interested in obeying because rebellion is bred into us. So, um, 
The reality is each of us was blessed and cursed by our parents. Every one of us was blessed by our parents. We were cursed by our parents. And, and every parent will bless and curse their children. We need to know it. We need to name it. We need to forgive it. And we need to choose to bless way more than we curse. So uh, let me say it again. We need to know it. And we need to name it. Uh, and we need to forgive. And then we need to make a decision to bless. So you got to know it. you got to name it. So my parents uh, blessed me tremendously. Uh, they gave me a great work ethic against my will. Uh, they really did. They, you know, they taught me to work. Uh, they modeled a, a marriage that, you know, lasted uh, unto death. And, and so it was, they were faithful and they fought, and, but they, they, were, they, they were committed. And so they showed me that it doesn't, you know, you can, you can make it through the tough times as well. And, and best of all, they gave me this wonderful faith foundation in Jesus Christ. Amen. So they blessed me tremendously. Uh, my parents cursed me too. Uh, they called me lazy. I mean, they just did. I mean, it, all the time. It wasn't like once. Uh, and it was something that I carried for a long time uh, and, uh, and caused a lot of harm in my life. Uh, they, they gave me a pride, not the good kind, uh, a pride where you don't ever ask for help, even if you desperately need it. And so uh, that caused, uh, again, a lot of pain in my life as I had to deal with that. And uh, they cursed me with having absolutely no roots whatsoever. I mean, I was always the new kid everywhere I went, and, and I didn't have a chance to build these long-lasting friendships and stuff. Uh, and so I didn't realize what I was missing on that one until I planted some, myself somewhere. So uh, can you identify how your parents blessed you and cursed you? And, and this is one of those conversations that you may need to have with God you may need to have with friends, you may need to have with family, you may need to have, with your, again, with your counselor. Uh, it may be a conversation that, that you need to explore because we need to identify uh, how we've been blessed and cursed. And, and if you can't identify how your parents blessed and cursed you, then praise God for the blessings and then forgive the curses. Again, if you know what the, the ways that your parents blessed you and cursed you, then praise God for the blessings. You need to celebrate the good things that they taught you. Because your parents did bless you. And you need to forgive the ways they cursed you. Now, if you're still trapped in those curses, then we got this great ministry called Celebrate Recovery that meets Monday nights at 6.30 in Sweetwater. Okay, and that will help you break free from some of those curses if they're still plaguing your life. But, uh, you know, for bless, praise God for the blessings, forgive the curses. And then, can you identify how you blessed and cursed your kids? or how you're blessing and cursing them right now if you've got kids at home. Uh, now, by the way, if you can't identify how you blessed and cursed your kids, just ask them. <laughs> just ask them. They will tell you. They will, you know, and if they, if they don't, then they're, they're still afraid or you're still paying for their, their life or whatever. Um, and, and if you know how you cursed them and how you blessed them, apologize for the curses. Don't justify, don't defend, just say you're sorry. This can be incredibly healing. If you dare to do it. Again, we're talking about God redeeming. So just say, hey, I messed up because uh, there's no perfect parents and I'm sorry. And then, this is really important, from this point forward, decide to bless. Intentionally, decide to bless your kids. Decide to bless them with your words. Decide to bless them with your actions. Decide to show them respect. Okay, especially your sons, because they're, they're, they're desperate for it. Some of you are desperate for it. Some of, like, some of you guys in this room, you know, you're desperate because your dad never respected you, and that still hurts. And you can't even talk to him about it because he's been dead for 30 years. And I'm, just, I'm just saying, we, we can break those cycles. So from this point forward, decide to bless, because all parents bless and curse their children, and since that's a reality, then let's bless more than we curse. Let's bless more than we curse. Finally, the third thing I see in this story of dysfunction that relates to our stories, lead your family toward God, and God will redeem your family. Lead your family. This is a commitment to lead your family toward God, and God will redeem your family. Now, see, Jacob instilled 
faith and ethics in his son Joseph. Okay, we see how it pays huge dividends. That's next week, so I want you to tune in for that one as well. Uh, and, uh, and, but it, 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 it changed the whole trajectory of the story because Jacob blessed Joseph with that faith and ethics. So the question that I want to ask you, this is the question I want you to struggle with this week. You and the Holy Spirit really need to have a conversation. And simply this, what direction are you leading your family? What direction are you leading your family? Are you leading your family toward Jesus or are you leading them away from God? Now I know, you're, you're in church. You're like, oh, of course, I'm leading my, my family toward Jesus because I'm in church or I'm watching church online. And, and that's obviously a way that I'm leading my family toward Jesus. But uh, I'm, I'm just gonna tell you the reality. If following Jesus is a priority for you, I mean, you, you live your faith, okay? You're, you're making an attempt to actively follow Jesus, then chances are your children will follow Jesus, if church and religion and rules are your focus, then there's a good chance your kids will walk away from faith. If God is just an afterthought, something the family does occasionally, and Jesus probably won't be important to your children. Okay, that, that's how this plays out. Statistically, in surveys, all that kind of stuff. So please, please, please lead your family toward God. Let me talk to the parents who have kids at home. If your kids are at home, talk about your faith. Share how Jesus has changed your life. Let your kids catch you reading the Bible. Let them catch you praying. Actively say, hey, I want to pray with you. And let them hear you pray for them, for God to bless them and lead them and, and fill them with life and joy. And, and let them hear you pray, God, help me to be a better parent. Let them know you're working on this and you're following God in this. Uh, and then when they're older, serve together. I mean, you know, we've got the, the Halloween Main Street activities that, that we're engaged in. If your kids are old enough, go down there and give out candy. They can eat all the candy. They can take candy home. They can bring a bag and fill it up, okay? We don't care. Uh, I, look, bless them by letting them serve other people. At Christmas time, you know, get... Get the backpacks that we give out or angel trees and fill them up. Let your kids do the shopping for other children. It will bless them. It makes the faith come alive. And then when they're old enough, do missions together. Go to Peach Springs. You can take your kids to Peach Springs and throw a Christmas party. Um, you know, do missions together. When they get old enough, take them on trips. You know, I, look, my grandson Eli just turned nine. And when he's 10, he gets to go to Baja with his dad. And he is so excited about that. And I'm so excited that he's excited about that. And I've been telling my grandkids, I can't wait till you're old enough I can take you to Africa. Can't wait till you're old enough so I can take you to Honduras. Can't wait till you're old enough. And they, they're counting down that time. They want to go trout. I have to take mom along with them. Uh, but uh, that was their stipulations. I, I don't know. But uh, anyway, look, one of the best things I did as a parent was I, I took my kids on mission trips. Okay, it's just a priority for me, and I just want to take my kids along. And, and I will confess to you that I took my daughters more times to China than I did to Disneyland. And I don't feel like a failure as a parent. Okay, I'm just, I'm just telling you. Now, don't clap. It's, it's okay. It doesn't matter because well, all it matters is what they think, not what you guys think. But, but here's the thing. You can do those kinds of things. And by the way, if your kids are gone, you start talking to your grandkids about doing that. And, and then while you're at it, teach your kids about giving. Teach them godly generosity. It, it'll change their idea about money if you teach them how to give it generously. Now, if your kids are grown, it's a little different situation. So share with them, if you're if grown kids and God's changed your life since they were in the home with you, then, then share that with them. Share with your kids the difference that God is making in your life right now. Say, hey, Jesus changed my life and I want to tell you how. Uh, when they come visit you, bring them to church with you. I know, it's always like, well, they don't go to church, they don't wanna to go to church. No, convince them, Goes like, come on, uh, trust me. It's your opportunity, and if they go, no, we don't wanna go, just go, it's a priority, man, I wanna go. Or at least turn it on in the home and annoy everybody. Uh, <laughs> hey, you know, it's about priorities, right? So look, and then bless them and apologize. You know, look, there is past pain, and if their relationship is rocky or it's distant or whatever, uh, apologize. And, and, and look, that's true for, for moms and dads, you know, grandmas and grandpas, but uh, 
Unleash God's power to redeem by repenting of your pride and saying you're sorry. Look, men, again, a lot of you wish your dad had said, hey, I'm sorry. Okay, you would have loved those words. And your sons are waiting to hear that from you. You can let the curse sit there or you can break the curse and you can unleash God's power to redeem by picking up the phone or sending an email or writing a note or sitting down face to face with them and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just try it and see what God does. And then never stop praying for your kids and your grandkids. Ask God to reveal himself to them and ask God to just draw them to him. And and I'm just telling you, God, you do this, God's going to redeem your family. You might say, how's he gonna do that? Whatever way God chooses, okay? I mean, Joseph's family was divided and had this great secret about Joseph for over two decades, okay? Long time. Could have been upwards of 30 years. We know it was at least 20 years. And and so this is a family secret and it was family dysfunction and all that kind of stuff. I'm not gonna give the story away. You gotta come back uh, or read it yourself. But, But the thing is, God redeemed their family. God redeemed their lives. Joseph's story is crazy and painful and incredible, just like yours. Whatever you do, don't give up on God. Because God always redeems when we just continue to trust him. Even when we're in the middle of a pit surrounded by brothers who hate us and want to kill us. Even when it feels like we're in slavery. Let's pray. Father, thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for rescuing us out of the pit called sin and death and hell through the sacrifice of Jesus, your son. And God, you did that so that we could belong to you and so you could heal our hurts, you could redeem our lives, you could use us for your kingdom's purposes, and that's what we want. God, we're, we know we're crazy. We know our families are a mess. We know we need you to heal us and to teach us and to guide us and to make all things new. So we're asking you to do that. Give us the courage to show up at Celebrate Recovery. Give us the courage to make an appointment with a counselor or a pastor. Give us the courage to open our Bibles and to start applying it to our lives. Just give us the courage to follow you because we know that you're a God who never lets us down, who always redeems, and that we can trust you with our lives, with our families, with everything. We just ask you to work the miracles of redemption in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good news. God uses dysfunctional people who were raised in dysfunctional families for His glory. If you have questions or want prayer, visit calvaryaz.com forward slash connect and fill out a connect card. One of our pastors will contact you and pray with you. Well, that's all for today. Please join us again next week. Bye-bye. Looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.